evening and welcome. Uh, Felicia just uh, told, reminded us that this is our 14th program with AARP yeah. and uh, the Timaquan uh, Park Pre uh, Preserve. And so we are really excited uh, to be coming to you, whether it is in person or virtual. And again, I am Justine Conley, and I'm the Associate State Director for AARP Florida, and my area is North Florida. And so a couple of years ago, Felicia and I were, we kept showing up at some of the same events, and we would both say to each other, let's talk, let's get together, let's get together, let's get together. So finally, I said, Felicia, give me information, I'm calling you, and we got together, and so we put our heads together, and we started thinking in terms of how do we do this? And so on behalf of the AARP, the reason why we're doing this is that we are about helping people 50 plus choose how they live as they age. AARP is one of the oldest, largest, not-for-profit, nonpartisan organizations uh, that serve and advocate for people 50 plus. And so we said, let's talk about healthy living. And what's the best way to be healthy is to get out into the fresh air. And so we recognized that we have one of the largest urban park systems in the country. And so a lot of people don't take advantage of being out in the park. And so Felicia and I said, huh, what can we put together to get people out into the park? So some of the things that we've done in the park uh, when we were in person is we did a uh, plenary. Art, art in the park, uh, out in the open air. We did drumming. We've done stretching. We've done walk with the dock. We've done all kinds of different kinds of hikes. And so we can't wait to be back in person. But we did not want to miss an opportunity to be with folks and to offer folks virtual opportunities. And so that's what we're doing today. And we have great guests with us uh, uh, in way of... Uh, Miss Carol uh, Alexander, who is the director of the American uh, Museum. You'll hear more from her. And uh, Ranger Ted Johnson, you'll hear more from him. And so with that, uh, I want to welcome you. And so say glad that you are here. And one time on one of these um, uh, virtual events, we had someone from England. And so that's the beauty of being virtual. We have people from all over that can access this program. And so one of my desires and goals is to introduce the world to some of our parks in North Florida, because we have some of the best uh, undiscovered, unknown parks. And so I am grateful to be here. Thank you again. And I will hand it over to my partner, Felicia Boyd. Hello. Thank you, Justine. And that's why I always let her do the introductions. Um, <laughs> I just also want to mention that I'm here with Maida, uh, Maida Velez, who is our um, communications director for Timaquan Park Foundation. So if you have any questions or um, during uh, Carol and Ted's talk, um, if you want to, if you have a question for them, put it in the chat. And then at the end, Maida will kind of collate those and we'll um, go through those questions. So um, I'm the program and outreach director for the Timaquan Park Foundation. And like I said, I got with Justine makes it sound like we went back and forth, but she was the one that said, hey, we're getting together. And we're really excited because um, it gave us, it kind of forced us into um, looking at doing some different kinds of programming. So I'm gonna, I'll uh, share a screen thing here. So welcome to Healthy Living, Fresh Air, Fitness, Friendship, and Fun. Um, so according to the, the the CDC, uh, only about 25% of um, adults get the recommended uh, physical activity that they're supposed to get. And 29 engage in no leisure time act physical activity at all. And of course, during COVID, this has been a lot worse, um, people being cooped up. And so, um, Unfortunately, uh, research has shown that parks provide these unique opportunities to improve both our physical and mental health. And we know um, there's study after study about nature therapy. You can go as far as the, the studies on forest bathing, just getting outdoors. Um, you can take a walk in your neighborhood, which is great. 
Uh, but they say it's even better if you can get out into some sort of natural space or open space or natural setting. Um, so this is a map of Jacksonville, Duval County. And you'll see all these little green parts all over the county. That is what uh, Justine was saying. We have the largest urban park system in the United States. We have the National Park presence here, the Timaquan Ecological and Historic Preserve, uh, lots of um, salt marshes, and then specific sites that you can visit um, that have a visitor center, a National Park Service Visitor Center, a Fort Caroline National Memorial and Kingsley Plantation, and then just what we call wilderness park space at Theodore Roosevelt, Cedar Point. We have state parks, uh, Big Talbot Island, Little Talbot Island, Pumpkin Hill. And then we have these city preservation parks that ring the county. Um, and again, we call them our wilderness parks. They aren't, I mean, there's over 400 parks in Jacksonville. A lot of them are ball fields and things like that. These are parks where essentially it's a walk in the woods or a scenic overlook. So places that you can go hiking or biking, both on-road and off-road. There you are, Julie. Um, boating or kayaking or canoeing, going to the beach, you can go camping. Many of these parks are um, open, um, they're free, the national parks here are free, the state parks are five dollars, Huguenot and Hannah are five dollars, but very low cost open spaces where they're just, you can spread out, be away from, um, you know, if you want to socially or spatially distant, distance, and then there's just places that you can go just to sit and breathe, look at, you know, again, scenic overlook, watch the clouds scuttle by and just de-stress. So the Timacom Parks Foundation, our uh, mission is to preserve, promote and enhance Jacksonville's natural areas through community engagement, education and enjoyment. Um, we, uh, we did, our original mission was to preserve these environmentally sensitive properties. Uh, and we find that they help us, uh, help the city be resilient against storms and sea level rise and climate change. But uh, we also know that if people don't know about the parks, then they aren't going to value the parks. And so uh, one of our goals is to provide access and opportunities for people to get out into the parks. So a few years ago, we realized that we were always talking to the same people that always go out to the parks. Uh, people that, you know, runners and hikers and bikers. And we realized that we could utilize these parks to address some of the equity and health issues in the city. Because these parks are available for everyone. Um, and everyone can take advantage of these parks to get healthy. And so our programming has been, um, we're starting to redirect our programming to reach out to more non-traditional audiences to get a, a larger cross-section and more diverse population out to the parks. And sometimes that, you know, you can say, hey, you need to go to the park. And people are not going to necessarily go somewhere where they're not comfortable or they've not been comfortable before. So it is, um, kind of, we feel like it's kind of up to us to promote what our park partners are doing and provide accessibility. So. We have an urban outreach program where uh, we take kids, teens from the um, urban core, either go to school or live there, take them kayaking, do some nature studies. They help with service projects to, to understand that idea of environmental stewardship um, and to feel on ownership for these, for these parks. Uh, we do outreach to youth with special needs as alternatives to you know, just being in the classroom or being in their, um, their insular setting. Uh, we've been doing trail explorations, doing more uh, beginning hiking with women only. Uh, you know, we've opened up some uh, rebranded, say the Seven Creeks Recreation Area, but it's a little bit remote and not everyone feels comfortable going out by themselves. And so we're trying to do more walks where we uh, invite people and we they're not necessarily guided, but um, you know, we're there to walk along and kind of keep them on the trail. Uh, doing walks with, um, with veterans, again, a method of de-stressing. 
And then, um, you know, our kind of our signature program, our healthy living that we do with AARP to get active seniors um, out and away from being isolated and um, to help fight some of those, those problems of loneliness and, um, you know, just not having enough physical activity that seniors sometimes suffer from. So we have a lot of things coming up in the summer. We hope you can join us. We'll be doing a lot of volunteer projects to help our park partners throughout the summer, um, trail maintenance, working in our pollinator garden. Um, National Trails Day is this Saturday. We'll be leading a hike up at Betts Tiger Point. So if you're interested, um, email me afterwards and we'll get you on the list. And then we're going to be um, doing our urban outreach um, and so next Saturday, we'll be fishing with groundwork uh, teams. So if you know how to fish, we can use your talents. And so you can learn more about us at timaquamparks.org. So today we are, um, again, we've been trying to do these virtual programs. So trying to find, you know, it's hard if you're not in the park um, to find uh, speakers that are interested in talking about the parks. And so um, we've reached out to our national park partner. Um, and so today we're going to um, talk about the history of American Beach. We've got a lot of history in Jacksonville, everything from the Timucuan Indians to the French that were here at Fort Caroline and the Kingsley Plantation. Um, today we're going to talk about American Beach. And I'm really excited to um, again, have National Park Service Ranger Ted Johnson, who's going to be uh, taking us on a tour of some of the more notable sites. And then um, we're especially pleased to have American Beach Museum Director Carol Alexander. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and turn this, um, turn this over to them to take us on our walking tour of American Beach. Stop sharing. All right. Well, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Felicia uh, and Justine, for those introductions and uh, for inviting us today. Uh, and we want to uh, also thank, of course, uh, AARP and Tim McQuan Parks Foundation, um, you know, for this series and inviting us uh, to have this opportunity to share and engage uh, with, with such a, an extensive group virtually. So this is a, a real privilege for us. Uh, and as Felicia has said, um, you know, the series, the Healthy Living series is, is great in that um, it, it provides opportunities to explore both the cultural uh, and natural, um, you know, the environment that's here, uh, the resources uh, in this area locally. And, um, you know, we're, we're really lucky that, um, uh, well, well, let me clarify again with the, actually my, my position. Uh, so here at Timaquan Ecological and Stewart Preserve, uh, I'm the community engagement specialist. And so uh, that uh, position uh, provides an opportunity to reach out and, uh, you know, work with folks in the, in the local community um, uh, and figure out how we can work together, partner, as we do with Timocon Parks Foundation, uh, to uh, uh, provide uh, the resources and news and information about the, the resources uh, that are here in this area to a larger audience. So today, uh, we are privileged to have with us Carol Alexander, and she's going to share with us um, some of the history of um, uh, perhaps a, a lesser known location uh, on Amelia Island, known as uh, American Beach. And uh, during the era of Jim Crow segregation, this was a very unique location uh, because it did provide an opportunity for African Americans to be able to enjoy recreation and relaxation uh, without uh, any of the social challenges. So without further ado, um, I'm going to turn everything over to Carol and give her an opportunity to explain about the, the history uh, and this the wonderful museum, the American Beach Museum, which is one of the true gems uh, of not only American Beach, but uh, basically our, our larger community here in Northeast Florida. So Carol, if you don't mind, would you mind just taking it away? Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. And I am so delighted to be amongst people like myself, senior. <laughs> and it's so important to be able to learn and share all the different things we have um, to offer globally. And 
for us right here in Florida and specifically on Amelia Island. I am a bit more biased, but I think American Beach is the greatest place that ever spawned out of the island. And on American Beach is the American Beach Museum. So without further ado, I would just like to open up to a tour. And a tour is something that you would always receive when you would come to American Beach and especially before the museum, there was a museum without walls. And the tour was always given by the infamous Marvin Oshun Betch, the beach lady. I'm going to give a tour, but it's going to be virtually for you. So let's take that away. Andrew, we cannot hear it, so let's start it over again. Welcome to American Beach Museum on the historic American Beach. Our museum tells the history of triumph over oppression, of love over hate, or can simply put the spirit of people who had a dream and was able to make the dream alive. That is American Beach. The American Beach Museum tells the history of African Americans on this island that dates way back to the 1700s. Well, Amelia Island was an entry point for the Atlantic slave trade. And when the slave trade was illegal in 1808, the Spanish continued to bring in ships, and if they were caught, they would sometimes just throw the human cargo over into the Atlantic Ocean. Hmm. People say that we can still hear, feel the spirit of the African people in the ocean as the waves come in and go out. But after the Emancipation Proclamation was read in 1865 in Fernandina, some of the slave owners deeded land to their former slaves. Well, one slave owner by the name of the Harrisons gave a parcel of their land to their former slaves. And one of their leaders, his name was Franklin Town, named that parcel of name after him, Franklin Town, all one word. Well, Franklin Town began to thrive. Well, they were farmers, they were agriculturalists, they were fishermen, and people would just come from many parts of Florida and Southern Georgia to Franklin Town because it had a shoreline. The Afro-American Industrial and Benefit Society was begun by seven men. They were very conscious of their people not having services, not having funds to care for their loved ones. So they put their funds together and the organization began in 1901 with the name Afro-American Industrial Benefit Association. It began very big, people received it well. Five months after the company began, the city of Jacksonville burned down. But their secretary, Eartha M. M. White, whose mother came from the Harrison Plantation on the Amelia Island, gathered all of the files from the new Afro-American Industrial and Benefit Association and ran to a part of Jacksonville where the fire was not blazing. Most of the men who began the company had to do what they must for their people, their churches, their families, their parishioners, people who were sick. And there was one who they turned to that said, you need to keep the company going while we rebuild. And that one out of the seven 
His name was Abraham Lincoln Lewis. He was born in 1865. Of course, you can imagine why his parents named him Abraham Lincoln Lewis in 1865. But he continued to do the work of the Afro-American Industrial and Pension Association and soon became the president. Oh, he was an industrious, genius young man. A lot of vision he had. And the Afro-American Industrial Benefit Association soon became the Afro-American Life Insurance Company with its president, A. L. Lewis. He didn't like the name Abraham Lincoln. So he would call himself A.L. Lewis. Well, A.L. Lewis would bring the employees up to Franklin Town. Franklin Town, as we said, was thriving. And they would come for relaxation and recreation without humiliation, a quote of A.L. Lewis, because during that time, you could not go on the beaches. We know stories about Jim Crow when there's racism and racial discrimination where African-Americans could not go to public facilities, including a beach. In Jacksonville, there was an ordinance that said, no white person or persons could bathe near any black person or persons within 500 feet of each other. So African-Americans, after hard weeks of work, had no place to relax but Franklin Town. So A.L. Lewis continued to bring the employees up to this area and soon saw some vacant land next to Franklin Town. He inquired about it and in 1935, the Afro-American Life Insurance Company's Pension Bureau bought 33 acres with about a thousand feet of shoreline. And A.L. Lewis called it American Beach because we are as American as everyone else. And American Beach, its tagline was, quote, recreation and relaxation without humiliation, end quote. So American Beach began in 1935. Now I have to stop you on this tour because five will come up a lot. Abraham Lincoln was born in 1865. American Beach was founded in 1935. And also in the same month, in the same year as the founding of the beach, it's, how can we call her? She was the protector. She was the saving grace of American Beach. And that is Marvine Bitch. Now, I want to emphasize the name Marvine Bitch, who was born in 1935, the same year that the beach was founded in 1935, and also another historical point, the Great Hurricane was in 1935. Well, the beach continued to thrive. Oh, the people from Jacksonville would come in droves up to sunbathe. Soon the Afro-American Life Insurance Company, in particular its pension bureau, put funds to build pavilions so that people could come up and have bathing suit rentals and possibly just rent out a space for a day. Then they would build cottages on Julia Street, which is the same street that the museum is on, where people could come and bring their families, spend a day, a couple of days soon. The employees of the Afro-American Life Insurance Company began to build their homes. A.L. Lewis was the first. Dr. Freeman was the second. And on and on. And then they soon, two years later, started to look around at other property that could become available adjacent to the beach. And by 10 years later, they were able to purchase a hundred more acres of land. Oh, 
By this time, people were coming to American Beach as far as North Carolina. Can you believe it? Texas. Oh, my goodness. You know, I have heard some people say they've come as far as Philadelphia or Merlin just because it was the haven for African Americans. In fact, there was a motto in their marketing that they would say, American Beach, the Negro Ocean Playground. Oh, did you hear about the Green Book? I know you saw that movie too. On the Green Book, they had American Beach where African Americans could come or the Negroes can come and safely. We were colored, then Negro, then African Americans, but that Green Book said safe place for the Negro. Well, continue the story about American Beach. Oh, if you were somebody, you could come. If you wanted to see entertainment, it's American Beach. Well, American Beach began to have restaurants and hotels and clubs. People like Cab Calloway, Dizzy Gillespie. Uh, and you know, one of the founders of the Afro had a relative that was introduced to none other than Green Cove Springs, Zora Neer Hurston. So of course she married this, his, this gentleman that was related to Price, which was her first husband and they would even come up. So we had literary giants, we had musicians, we had people like A. Philip Randolph, civil rights leaders, all would come to American Beach. Well, A.L. Lewis said, there must be more beach property that we need. Well, of course, you know, history and the war began and the United States had a place at the end of American Beach at that time that the state, the United States owned, and it was really the lookout for the submarines. So after the war, A.L. Lewis said, we need to get that part of the beach. And he petitioned and was able to get 83 more acres, making 216 acres of American beach with a long shoreline. By this point, oh, there were the most beautiful houses. Now, the beach lady would say, the houses are modest outside, but beautiful inside. Now, American Beach just was this haven. Let me go back to 1935, you know, the year that it was founded and the year this little girl was born. Her name, as I told you earlier, was Marveen Bitch. Well, she went to the Overland, Overland Conservatory Musical College and became an opera singer in, New, in, in Europe. Oh, she sang in Germany. She had a beautiful voice. And she would come and play at American Beach. Her best memories were of the beach. Well, she had to cut her career short and returned to American Beach in 1970s because her mother and her grandfather were ill and they did make transition, but she decided to stay. But when she came back in the 70s, she looked around at how American Beach had began to just disappear. All of the sounds and the people were not there. Well, in 1964, Hurricane Dora came through and pretty much knocked everything down. A lot of the people could not afford to build. And also with the Civil Rights Act in 1964, where people could go anywhere that they wanted, African Americans could now go on white beaches, go in places that they couldn't. They didn't come back here very much, but Marveen sat and she thought and she had the memories and she felt the spirit of her great grandfather and she felt the spirit of those people who came and worked hard to build this luxurious retreat resort. And she said, oh, I have to do something about that. 
And she began to tell everybody about the history of the beach. She began to write letters to all kinds of journalists. People would start coming and interviewing her about the history. And then she said, hmm, I'm a woman of the stage, the lights. I attract people not only with my stories and song, but the way that I look. So she began to grow her locks of hair and long fingernails. And she would always wear the color orange because she says that one time she would become a butterfly. Well, Marlene would tell everyone about the beach. And soon, people on Amelia Island would begin to call her the beach lady. But she was a political woman and an a entertainer, an ecologist, but her politics were first. So when Ronald Reagan was president, she hated Ronald Reagan. She didn't want anything to do with Ronald Reagan, so she dropped the R in her name and she became Ma Veen. Oshun, the ocean, bench. Ha. But she would walk around with her sandy feet and flip-flops all around Fernandina telling about the history. All kinds of journalists and news people were doing documentaries about her and the beach. And once again, the name American Beach became known. Well, the beach lady kept that history going and going and she would do tours. And this is part of it. Baby. Welcome to American Beach, founded in 1935. You know, five is my magic number. I was born in, in 1935. My great-grandfather was born in 19, 1865. Oh, and the Voting Rights Act, 1965. Everything that is important, wonderful, fabulous happens with a five. So five is my magic number. So hello, I'm the beach lady. That's how she would start. Well, this museum was her dream. This museum was the vision that she had to keep the story of the Afro American Life Insurance Company, the story of the people who rose above oppression and racism and Jim Crow to triumph in a land where they could relax, where they could have fun with their family and have home ownership here on American Beach. So when you come to visit this museum, you will see all of that come to life come alive. You will feel the spirit. You will hear her voice through repetitious sounds of her opera like Salome and Madame Butterfly. You would also see her seven locks of hair. She asked me to cut her hair when she made transition and she also told us that she would make transition with a fire. Ah, the beach lady was born in 1935. She made transition September 5, 2005 at 5 a.m. When you visit here, you will see the magic. You will feel her spirit and the African-Americans who rose above to triumph. American Beach. Excellent. Um, well, we want to um, continue uh, just a moment. We, we're, we're going to have an opportunity to, to chat uh, and ask oh, uh, really good. questions um, uh, of Ms. Alexander. But we just wanted to uh, just kind of complete this tour, as it were, um, with a little stroll through American Beach, uh, just a, a brief visit to some of the most notable sites that uh, uh, still remain uh, in the community. So if we can roll that, please. So looking back and remembering some of the history that Carol share with us, we can see some of these sites as I look today. Um, and there are some markers that uh, are throughout the community. So if you do visit, you get to 
learn about some of the places that still exist, including uh, Rudy's Sweet Tooth was an ice cream uh, parlor shop there uh, that dates back probably to about the 1960s. Uh, so that uh, mm -hmm. that's, uh, still remain uh, structurally. Um, and then as uh, Carol shared, there were all kinds of restaurants and there were nightclubs. Uh, the probably most notable was Evans Rendezvous. Uh, so as she said, uh, Shetland Circuit folks, Duke Ellington, Cab Calloway, Ella Fitzgerald. It is now today owned by a Nassau County. Um, this is also a uh, sweet shop there that I don't think ever actually opened. Um, places to, to stay included the A.L. Lewis Motel dating back to the 1940s, late 1940s, early 50s. Uh, still maintained uh, uh, today, and there are tenants there. And then, um, because of Ma Veen's, um, you know, her, her efforts to, to save not only the cultural, but also the natural landscape, what is protected today by the National Park Service, thanks to her efforts, is um, the, uh, we believe, the largest dune, uh, highest dune in uh, Florida today a 60-foot dune known as Nana Dune, um, named by Maveen, and uh, that means uh, grandma or mama. And uh, there is another in this system called Little Nana Dune, and that's uh, right now maintained by the North Florida Land Trust. So luckily we're able to protect a significant uh, amount of the natural landscape. It is, this dune, a uh, home to at least one keystone species, which is the gopher tortoise, and that keystone means uh, a species that provides housing or homes for other species. Gopher tortoises do burrow down, uh, maybe rabbits, snakes may also share their uh, home. Uh, if you want to enjoy the, the, some time by the seaside, uh, there are two entrances onto the beach. There is uh, one um, on the uh, 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 northern end of the community, and this one on the southern end, Bernie Park, Beachfront Park. So there are uh, restrooms there. Uh, there's also a boardwalk that leads out across the beautiful dunes and gives access to uh, the beach. So there are also activities there. There's a little pavilion. So, uh, and th there are some uh, uh, campouts uh, as well on the beach that uh, uh, have been and hopefully will be again uh, featured. And you see there in the background that gopher tortoise. So, uh, version an example of the uh, the sea keystone species. This overlooking uh, the community there and behind that yellow home, that yellow building there is where Mavin Betch, the beach lady, uh, lived for many years. And that trailer that you saw there uh, could be seen or that chair recliner nearby as she was sharing the uh, cultural and the uh, natural history of the area. So if you get an opportunity, folks, please, uh, come up and take your own private tour and walk through uh, American Beach. Uh, I will add a couple quick things. Um, so that area, the, the community is, is great to, to walk through and see some of these remains uh, that are there structurally. There's also a biking trail that takes you all along uh, sections of A1A and you can also bike through the community. So again, sharing what uh, Felicia and uh, uh, Justine have talked about as far as getting out and getting some exercise while you enjoy uh, the history of the area. Um, I also want to, um, before we get into the questions, uh, the, this video that you saw, both of them, uh, were uh, a courtesy from uh, a, a, an intern who is also part of our team. I did not want to, to uh, not introduce him. His name is Andrew Mentrup, so he's an intern here. And he put all that together and, and, and filmed everything and edited. And I, I want to thank Andrew for his uh, very clever IT work. So then, ladies, I don't know if you want to take over now. And if there are questions that, that we can try to help to answer, more particularly Carol, please take it away. We'll do what we can. Thank you, Ranger Ted. Felicia, um, our guests have any questions? Uh Let's see, in the chat room. Um, yeah, there was some conversation going on here. Maida, did you? No, I was gonna say no questions yet. So everyone, please feel free to ask. Um, there were some comments that people thought uh, this was an awesome presentation 
absolutely fabulous. We love to hear that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, someone did comment that the North Florida Land Trust um, is trying to uh, raise funds to purchase Nana Dune, but uh, it's really little Nana Dune that they're trying to raise money for, which I believe is, um, Ted, is that right next to Nana Dune? Yeah, basically adjacent, uh, very close by. Yeah, and I, and I did say that, yeah, little, little Nana Dune. Okay, and then uh, so a couple questions. Uh, was Maveen, uh, Maveen born in American Beach? No, she was not, but close by in Jacksonville, Florida. Oh, okay. Um, and then the museum hours, what are they? Uh, it's uh, not open right now, we understand. Right. Presently, we are closed. We've been closed um, due to COVID, and now we are doing some renovations and I will let everyone know a little news that has not been told by anyone. We will be opening again September, of course you know what day, September the 5th of this year, but under our new name. And our new name will be the A.L. Lewis Museum on American Beach. So we are renaming the museum after the founder of American Beach. So you all are the first to know. Fantastic. A um, couple more questions. Someone says, um, have you organized walking tours? Um, we do have some here and there, and we are trying to pull all of that together as you know, scripted so that you can go see all of the streets. But right now, we're all on lockdown. We are a very small board of five people and all volunteers. So we're trying to put all of that together, but by September, you can call us and you can have your own walking tour, your personal walking tour. I see a flyer that is up. A lot of things go on on the beach and something that is coming up sep uh, September, I'm sorry, Saturday, June the 19th is a 5K and jazz concert. So if you are all around, just come down to the beach. The 5K is early in the morning at 8 a.m. And the 1K, if you just want to do a little jog for a minute, it will start at 9. And then there will be some historical um, presentations and a presentation by A.L. Lewis's great-granddaughter, Dr. Janetta Betch Cole. So please come out and join us on June 19th. Fantastic. Um, we have a few more question, questions. Um, Terry asks, what happened to the beach? Oops, hold on, lost it here. Um, as in, when did it stop being segregated? Um, when did it stop being segregated? It's, it's kind of hard to, to answer the question with the words. American Beach, we did not segregate others. So American Beach was always open. Um, right now, the beach is changing um, a bit to where it is very integrated at this point. Um, and it started to begin, we started to begin seeing a lot of people inter people's interest in American Beach from other places, maybe about five, six years ago. So now you will see a truly integrated uh, beach community on American Beach, but we are trying to keep that history alive so people understand the sacredness of this beach and the historical treasure that it is not just to come and be a resort place on the island. It's historic. You have to know that at one time it was four people who could not join white people on other beaches. So we'll never allow that story to go away and the story of the beach lady and her advocacy for nature and history. Great. Um, Julie asked, yeah. how much is the admission fee? So I'm uh, assuming that's for the museum. Yes. Um, at the Well, I don't want to advertise that right now. <laughs> <laughs> because with the name changing, we are also going to be changing our admission structure. But it is cost effective. And if you are a member of AARP, it's always going to be a discount. 
<laughs> Fantastic. I can't wait. <laughs> okay, next question um, from Bill. Uh, I'm sorry, from Lucy. She says, uh, well, we they have access to the video later, which I take is to be, um, uh, Carol, your video? No, that is the park. Oh, Ranger Ted? Oh. Ranger Actually, Ted that, we, they, go ahead. Yes. Um, actually, I'm going to jump in here because we will post it with our other um, Healthy Living Series talks on the TimaquamParks.org uh, website. So you'll go to the same place that you registered Healthy Living or TimaquamParks.org backslash healthy dash living. Um, just go to our website. Uh, give it a couple of weeks because we usually chop out the beginning and the end and the video will be at that site. Great. Okay. A uh, question from Bill was, uh, wasn't American Beach established after the American African Americans got kicked out of the Hannah Park area? Um, I think he meant Manhattan Beach. Uh, I believe, uh, Ted, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, American Beach was established first in the 30s, and then later in the 60s, I think Manhattan Beach, uh, which was now Hannah Park, was established. Is that right? Well, I think gentleman, uh, gentleman was correct in that... Um, it was actually earlier. Um, no, uh, it was in the Beach. Flagler era. Um, and so, yeah, that was um, an alternative. And there was an area down uh, along the beaches um, also where African Americans, uh, you know, along the, you know, further down into the beach area there, um, uh, that where there was also an area for African Americans. Um, but, but, but definitely. Uh, very challenging. I, I wanted to add something uh, as far as access is concerned. I wanted to add what, what uh, with the question about segregation. So I just wanted to revisit something that uh, Carol had said, and that that signing of that act, the 1964 Civil Rights Act, did have a, a significant impact uh, on kind of changing, um, you know, the, the visitation there. So it was it was unfortunate. Uh, in some, in some, you know, for, on some level, but also, of course, the rights and the granting of those rights, um, you know, it was a was a success. Now, the other thing I wanted to add is that culturally, going way back, these folks are also those that were enslaved initially, uh, are also considered to be part of the Gullah Geechee uh, culture, and so uh, this area is, is considered to be part of the. Gagichi Cultural Heritage Corridor. So they also celebrate uh, in that community that culture. Uh, individuals that were in more remote areas, uh, mostly island areas, that uh, had opportunities to you know, maintain some of their Africanisms um, because of the distance from the, the plantation owners during significant times of the year. So I wanted to make sure that was clear uh, yeah. as well. Yeah. Thank you, Ted, because that is a very important historical point with the Sea Islands and down into Amelia Island. Um, a lot of Afri Africans who were brought or left on those islands were doing a lot of agriculture and they were remote, as Ranger Ted said, and the language, the food, the, the, the music, the culture was more intact in these island communities than in inland because they were more left alone, if you will. Um, you know, there was of course, you know, the master and the supervisors over us, but we were away from the main land in terms of the numbers. Um, and that is very important to, to um, kind of investigate on your own about the Gullah Geechee um, corridor from all the way from South Carolina to Georgia down. Thank you, Carol. Uh, next question from Bill is, uh, did the original insurance company sell home sites or were people leasing the dirt or the land under the homes? Yes, the, um, there were 50 by 100 lots that the insurance company sold to initially um, the, its actuaries, the salespeople of the um, Afro-American Life Insurance Company and then it extended to other people, yes. Okay. Um, another question, uh, did the homes purchase, uh, I think, is that your same question, Bill? Did the homes buyers purchase the site from the insurance company or leased? They purchased. Okay. I had a problem with, 
with getting my chat to register on your list. So that's why it showed up twice. Oh, okay. Um, any of, please feel free uh, in the chat to list any more questions. Uh, we actually have a couple more people joining who uh, I think accidentally left the meeting. Um, I want to say, I think, I think Bill is right. I think Manhattan Beach was there first and then they had to move up to um, American Beach. And um, Ted, I think we need to check about whether there was a beach like in South Jack's Beach because there's a museum, the Rhoda Martin uh, Museum in South Jack's Beach that uh, preserves the legacy of the African-Americans who lived um, in that Jacksonville Beach area. And my understanding was that even though, because I think we read this recently, that the children, you know, they lived within a mile of the beach and they weren't allowed to go on that beach. So, um, yeah, I, I, think I, that's thought that, I agree. I thought that too, but but I did hear, I I, I uh, heard or read something recently. I, I was surprised to hear that, and I'm not sure of the period of time. So we'll we will research that and get back to the folks. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Felicia. Yeah. So maybe Justine, we need to take that uh, African American uh, museum tour. Yeah. You know, you were right about Manhattan Beach. Flagler bought yes. the property initially and gave it to his African American employees. There was also a Black Beach um, in St. Augustine. Um, there, Butler. There, Butler, yeah. mm -hmm. Butler Beach. Butler yeah. Beach was in St. Augustine. So there were many that um, popped up around the, around the coastal areas. One that's in the news um, right now is in Los Angeles. I don't know if you've read about that Black Beach and the city of Los Angeles took the property away from the family and they you know, sold it to investors and some of the family members years later have been digging it up and they are giving reparations back to the family, the great grandson, who um, the city now will have to give them millions in return. because They did not legally um, do the uh, taking away. They just said, we're taking it. Uh, domain and the, and the family bought it, I think, for something like $2,000 years ago, and it's worth millions now. Thank you, Carol. Um, we have a question from Miriam who says, are the houses being preserved or are they being sold? Um, both. Um, some homes are, have been and are being preserved, and some are sold and people are coming in um, modernizing them, I guess you would say. You know, uh, the beach lady said, ah, oh, look at those down here. They look like waffles. All of them seem the same. Here at American Beach, oh, we have character here. Everything isn't the same because people are all different. So should houses be. So those houses, some are being restored, some are being um, purchased um, and being renovated. Um, A.L. Lewis's original home was purchased and they leveled it and has been rebuilt um, supposedly in the same structural visual image, but I, I don't see it. It looks like a beautiful beach home of the 2021. It's very modernized. Okay, um, next question is from uh, Mary Beth, she says some years ago, she saw a film about uh, beach development around American Beach, and she thinks it was filmed partly in American Beach. Um, do you know about the film and if it is accurate? Um, there was a film, um, <laughs> I, it, the, the name escapes me, but there was a film about Amer uh, that was taken on American Beach, and it was based on the book called American Beach by Russ Reimer. Um, why does the film just escape me? Um, it'll come back to me. But yes, there was a film made um, on American Beach. Excuse me, was that called Sunshine State? Sunshine okay. State, yes. Yeah, that's a great film. John Sales film, is that what that is? John Sales, Sunshine State. Yeah, yeah. Correct. 
had Angela Bassett in it. And yeah, it was a great piece. Could, could I share something right quick? Um, you know, there we, uh, of course, Carol shared that um, there were so many publications uh, that featured Maveen and, and all her glory and, of course, American Beach. But uh, we mentioned the fingernails, and they were, uh, along with her locks, a very significant feature. And I wanted to show you that. I mean, they were incredible, if you can see that. The length of those, you want to talk about uh, Ripley's, but. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you, this is well, a since you said Ripley's, I have a story to share. Well, Marvine was, they call her my spiritual mother. My kids grew up with her and we were at her beck and call because she was a diva. <laughs> and one day she, this was before she got a phone because she didn't like anything, TVs, telephones, but she borrowed someone's phone and called me. And she was just, oh, hysterical. Oh my God, you have to come right away. Oh, she was hysterical. So I put my three young sons in a car, ran up to see Mama Mob, as we called her. And she was just hysterical when I got her calmed down. She explained to me that she was told that she will not be in the Guinness Book with her fingernails because there was an Indian gentleman who had fingernails that were two centimeters longer than hers. How could someone do such a thing? I have the longest nails. But she prided those nails to where she would cover them with a plastic bag, the bag that you um, receive your newspapers. She would take those bags and we would get there and she would cover the four fingers and hold her thumb to keep these beautiful orange nails intact without being cracked. But she missed by being in the Guinness Book of Records by two centimeters. <laughs> I, did, uh, I did find one more thing. This may have been what I was reading, Felicia. Um, it was talking about the, the Flagler era and Manhattan Beach. This is a Times Union article, and it does say uh, racial seg segregation was very much a reality in those days. Uh, indeed, in 1924, Pablo Beach, which I guess is what I was thinking about, passed a law officially making it illegal for whites and blacks to bathe together. So maybe that's what I had in mind. And maybe as a carryover from, I don't know whether from that Flagler era they were allowed there is not, or not. I don't know that, but, but you yeah, know, very possibly not. That, like that was yeah. what is now Jacksonville Beach, Pab Pablo Beach. And that's mm -hmm. where that ordinance came where you could not be 50 feet. A, a white person could not be, I mean, okay. not 50, 500 feet from a black person. But that was Pablo was what is now what we call Jacksonville Beach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I'll say one more thing, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of research uh, with the folks down in St. Augustine as well. And of course, the beach and, and uh, water related uh, civil rights protests were, were very significant. In addition to the Monson and, and all that, there were weighed in protests uh, on that beach. Uh, you, you mentioned Bernie, but I mean, St. Augustine beaches. And I think the cultural councils are they're talking about maybe revisiting that history in some way, there may be a, a kind of a commemorative. Um, so maybe we can try to keep folks informed of that. Uh, and I want to let folks know that there's an American Beach Museum uh, website. So don't, don't, don't you know, let them know about that, uh, Carol, because that's it's excellent. www.americanbeachmuseum.org. Thank you, Carol and Ted. Um, I've got a next question from um, Jim, who says, was Maveen a descendant of Anna Kingsley? Yes, she was. She, I don't know how many greats, but um, Anta Kingsley and Zephaniah Kingsley had children and their grandchild was A.L. Lewis's first wife, her name was Mary. Yes. So that means if A.L. was Marvin's great-grandfather, great, 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 three greats. 
Fantastic. Thank you. Any more questions, please just type them in the chat. Um, I will put in information about that Juneteenth event on the chat. Someone asked about that. Uh, Felicia, I'll turn it over to you for a second while I type. <laughs> So are there any other questions? I think Maida is sending the, the event. We, um, I saw Perry on here, Perry Betch, uh, Perry Francis Betch on here earlier. Perry, are you still here? I think she, no, anyway. So we are excited, Carol, to um, for the museum to be opening in the fall. Um, some people were asking. Hi, about oh, there she is. Hey, Perry. I'm driving. I apologize. I could. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I'm uh, on my way to hike in Little Town. Drive. I couldn't figure out how to unmute. Hi, Carol. Hi, Ted. Hello, everyone. Jeff. Hello. You're coming in and out, Perry. I'm on Hexer Drive by Little Tau, but I'm in a dead zone. Oh, okay. That is the reason why. I'm oh. getting ready to go hike in our state parks. Yes. So someone asked about uh, getting, you know, going up to American Beach. So Maida and I were up there just last week. We happened to uh, go up there and uh, you know, if you, you can just kind of take your own walking tour as well. You know, start at the museum and um, go down to Greg Street. There's signage for um, A.L. Lewis's house and um, the second house. And then you can go up to Nana Dune and read the signage up there. Go down to Bernie and visit with the gopher tortoise who evidently comes out for whoever uh, wanders by. Um, so. <laughs> you can also there's also a brief piece if you go to Nana Dune and they have a QR code that you can connect to that will give you a brief history of American Beach by the beach lady on the, the QR code. And if you do your own tour, just to know all of the streets, there are only 12 streets, but all of the streets, um, the last names, of course, the, the main street into American Beach is Lewis after A.L. Lewis, but all the other streets are after the other six men who began the Afro-American Life Insurance Company and also um, the relatives of A.L. Lewis, um, his mother, Julia, which is Julia Street, his son's name, James Street. So you will have those, those 12 streets just know they are history of the African Americans who walk there or are connected um, to the Lewis family and the Afro American Life Insurance Company. Um, can I ask one more question for folks um, making uh, African American community connections? So, is there one with the the Betches, Lewis, uh, and and La Villa? I, I just want. Uh, in the rip, or is that not? Is there a connection at all? Oh, between the Lewises and La Villa. Yeah. Oh well, yeah. The 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 La Villa. For those of you who do not know, it's a section of of Jacksonville, an old African American um, community. It was an encampment for Black Union soldiers, and some of those soldiers remain there. The question Ted was asking. Um, or is there a connection to the Lewises? I would come back with in a community that is a segregated community, all black folk kind of lived in two or three areas in La Villa and east side of Jacksonville, um, Sugar Hill, all of that was a very, very historic and prestigious African-American community. Um, now the, the highway has run through there. And yes, A.L. Lewis walked the same streets as James Weldon Johnson and Mary McLeod, uh, well, Mary McLeod Bethune would come up and visit him. So yeah, there is a big connection. The Afro 
um, is or was in that area. That's where the fire began when we talked about how Jacksonville burned down. That was La Villa. And the Ritz Theater and Museum um, is an institution that um, I created in 1999. It still exists and gives a big history of um, the African-American community in Northeast Florida, which includes American Beach. Yes, major connection that A.L. Lewis had in Jacksonville. That was his first um, you know, home site. And did I say that A.L. Lewis was the first black millionaire in the state of Florida? And the Afro American Life Insurance Company was the first insurance company of Florida, black or white. Just a little known black history fact. Okay, thank you. Um, I did post a couple of links in the chat um, for the Melanin Parks uh, website, which is where you can get the information about the Juneteenth event um, that people are asking about. One is kind of the generic link to the main page, and the second link is more specific where it has information um, about the day. Um, if any more questions, feel free, type them in there. Lucy um, asked. Lucy asked if I visit American, is there, are there instructions for a self-guided tour? And I was going to say, no wander around, but Carol, are there, is there kind of a sheet? No, there's, there, there's not a uh, sheet that you, that will guide you through, but that is a great idea. We should develop one. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's not hugely big, so um, you, yeah, you won't necessarily get lost if you start at the museum and just, like I said, walk down Lewis and come back up the one that's right next to it. Mm -hmm. Or walk down to Bernie and then around. There's a question from Jim. He asks, doesn't uh, the Ritz Museum contain exhibits on A.L. Lewis? Yes, the um, Ritz Theater and Museum has a, um, exhibit of the Afro, what the Afro-American Life Insurance Company looked like, its offices, his office, some information about the Lewis family. So yes. Fantastic. Um, there's a comment from Jen Geneva. She says the tour has been informative, new of the beach, but not the complete history. Um, this would be do good to do again. Um, so we appreciate comments like that. Thank you. Uh, any more questions and uh, lovely comments? We'll take those. <laughs> Again, someone asked if the video would be available and uh, we will have it on our, um, uh, on the Tippecanoe Parks Foundation website um, under the Healthy Living tab. Uh, give it a, you know, a week or so so that we can get it, like I said, chop out the front and the back and um, kind of clean it up. So, um, but the, this presentation and the videos will be on that website. Okay. Any last minute? This is the last call for questions and comments. Okay, Felicia, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Well, thank you again for, um, oh, wait a minute. This one is a good one from Lisa. Were there ever drawings? Because we did not uh, we didn't go into this, but um, were there ever any drawings prepared for the development? And kind of what is the future of American Beach? Mm. Well, I'll ask, answer, there were drawings and land plats um, that were available for um, the beginning of American Beach. And we've seen some up as far as probably 61. Um, some of those are in the museum, you know, just kind of the, the original ones, those land plats. Um, and for the, the future of American Beach, we just hope that um, God's beautiful shoreline continues to give comfort and joy um, to all people. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. 
So thank you, Ted and Carol. Um, this was really exciting and special and, and it's hard to get you, Carol. So we are really um, quite pleased that, that we had this video and that we were able to have you today. Thank you. So, Okay, so. Thank you, folks, and thank you again, Andrew, for also, again, producing this for us. So, and Excellent. thanks everybody who attended with the questions. Yeah, we made it. So right. we'll stay on for a few minutes because some people like to socialize, or um, you know, if you have any other questions, you can actually. I think our our number has gotten small enough. Oh, well, now we still have forty three people on. But can um, I uh, just have one last statement? Yeah. Certainly. <laughs> Sorry, I've been multitasking, uh, have three things going on. But I just want to say again, thank you for coming on. Thank you um, for both of our speakers this morning. And I also want to encourage you, if you want to find out more of what's going on with AARP, and we have a lot going on across the state as well as in Jacksonville, you can go to aarp.org forward slash near you or aarp.org forward slash Jacksonville. But please check us out. We have everything, a little something for everyone. And so again, thank you for being here. I see there's like one final question popped up. So I'm going to share it. They're asking who owns American Beach now? The people. Great question. The people own American Beach. Um, all of the land is sold to individuals. So wow. yeah, the people own American Beach. Yeah, you can go, I mean, you can, like I said, you can walk down the street, you can go to the beach, it does, you know, it's a, again, another, a, another park, another venue that's free, take the kids and, you know, just be careful by the water because it's the beach, but, um, again, a nice, beautiful outdoor space. And you will always hear the spiritual voice of the beach lady. If you just hear in your ear somebody going, baby, welcome. <laughs> To American Beach. It wouldn't be me. It would be the beach lady. She still has her voice just in the air, in the wind. I hate I didn't meet her in person. Hmm? I hate that I, get, I didn't get to meet her in person. <laughs> no, I think Carol's going to be the next beach lady. Maybe not quite as... as uh... <laughs> <laughs> oh, no one can be. No one, no, no, no. From the hair to the nails and all that. No, correct. <laughs> I didn't. I did see her uh, one time. I like how you evoked her, though, in the uh, in the video. That was not, her intro. That yeah. was a nice. <laughs> mm -hmm.